It's episode 641 of the Locked On Raiders podcast. On today's show, I'm giving five reasons why the Rangers should not consider trading Martin Perez. Plus, the Rangers signed a former Cy Young winner, and it does not mean a darn thing. All that and more on this episode of Locked On Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Rangers. Your daily Texas Rangers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. You are locked on the Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Patrick, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan since 2010, founder and host for all four seasons of this Locked On Rangers podcast. Today is Tuesday, July 26. Rangers are 43 and 52 after that very, very frustrating yet another, another one run loss to the freaking Seattle. Mariners. Thank you all so much for making Lockdown Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can go ahead and follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers and subscribe on YouTube, where the best way you can help grow the show is to comment anything below. Now, let's get into this very, very frustrating, yet another one-run game, yet another everything kind of felt like it was going okay, okay until it wasn't, and it ended up in another one-run loss to the freaking Seattle Mariners, which it feels like every single game the Rangers play, they do mostly well. They ride it out, couple little goof off here and there, and then, boom, a one-run loss to the Seattle Mariners. It's like the exact story of this whole season. But, you know, there were some there were some good parts. And Oles Garcia had his third home run since the All-Star break. He's at 18 now. Uh, it was a very, very important home run to get the Rangers on the board, or excuse me, a little bit closer in the first place. Nathaniel Lowe had his 14th home run of the season coming off that 0 for 6 day in which everybody felt like dominated, and he went 0 for 6 with four strikeouts. He had his 14th home run of the season, which made it a one-run game in the ninth inning, which, you know, Again, shocker, Rangers did poorly in a one-run game. But overall, offensively, this was just a really, really bad day for the Rangers. Nathaniel Lowe had two of the six hits on the day. Adoles Garcia's dinger was, uh, yeah, one of those. Duran and Smith at the bottom of the lineup each got a hit, and Duran walked once. But the top of the Rangers lineup didn't do much of anything. Over, over uh, let's see, 12 combined there in the one through three spot spot in this lineup. Corey Seager did get on base with a walk, but overall just not a good day for this Rangers offense. They were 0 for 10 with runners in scoring position, left seven on base, and the first run they scored, they had the bases loaded with, I believe, one out, and the only run scored on a wild pitch. The Rangers weren't able to get a sack fly, a ball in the outfield, just nothing. Absolutely nothing doing in this one. Some decent base running. Duran had his third stolen base of the season, but Dulce Garcia got caught um, later on trying to steal in a game where he might have been safe, but there was not really a need. There weren't that many base runners in this one, so it, it felt like on the edge of going and being too aggressive in this one. The Rangers also got Ty France. He had his 13th home run of the season, a three-hit game. Um, really kind of the anchor moving everything that was happening in this Seattle lineup. But, I mean, the Mariners didn't have a whole lot of offense either. They only had eight hits in this one, three walks. But, you know, a frustrating fourth inning where the Rangers could have turned a double play to get out of that inning with, I believe, allowing either one or no runs and still having a tie game at that point just did not happen. Ezekiel Duran wasn't quite fast enough. He's still learning the position of third base, but I feel like he could have been a little bit better on that attempted double play um, on Carlos Santana. It's not like he runs very fast, so could have been, could have been, should have been, would have been literally the story of the Texas Rangers in these close games. Also, the other one of Nathaniel Lowe's hits that I mentioned, his 15th double of the season, he has been crushing it this season and this is another solid start for Glenn Otto not a great one but he's your number four starter probably should be a number five starter but he has lived up to being a number four or five starter went five and a third innings only allowed three runs could have been fewer if the defense was a little bit better but again five strikeouts and his slider looked really really good his breaking stuff looked really good he was locating where he wanted to only one walk in this one he 
this is what he looks like when he's on. And, you know, it should have been one or probably only two runs that he allowed in this one. One of them came off the Ty France dinger. There's not much you can do about that. Ty France is one of the best hitting first basemen in baseball this season, and <laughs> he's going to get his every once in a while. He did only throw 82 pitches, which makes me think that this is a pretty hard limit on the Rangers saying, all right, you're going to go through the order two times, and that's it. Because once you hit three, that's when things get out of hand because he was at you know, five out of third innings, I thought, okay, wow, you could see Glenn Otto go pretty far into this one, but the Rangers brought in Brock Burke to get out of that sixth inning. He did allow a run himself, um, which came in the next inning, but the rest of the Rangers bullpen, Dennis Santana came in in a big spot and got a strikeout, which he doesn't get a whole lot of, and uh, looked really darn good in that plate appearance. And another positive should be mentioned in the bullpen, Jose Leclerc looked absolutely fantastic. It was still a close game. The Rangers were able to claw back, like I said, and make it that one-run game. In the ninth, he pitched the bottom of the eighth, allowed one walk, no hits, and three strikeouts. He looked just as nasty. The cutter, the cut changeup, I should say, and the circle changeup, the whatever he calls it, all of his weird funky pitches were looking fantastic. He was mostly hitting his spots, still a little bit of trouble with the command, but looked absolutely disgusting that is a huge huge development for this rangers squad now chris woodward was was very frustrated at the game and i'm going to uh break out my my chris woodward ted lasso voice in case you don't know this is a recurring bit that chris woodward has extreme ted lasso vibes but unlike ted lasso chris woodward actually does know about the sport that he's coaching that's pretty much the main difference in this one but here is what chris woodward had to say after the loss last night it's frustrating we made some little mistakes that led to a run or two. We have a victory in our grasp, and we just can't quite grab it. Maybe it's part of what they have to go through. You hope some character is being developed, some toughness is being built. We have to decide, how are we going to figure this out together? How are we going to figure this out together, Chris Woodward? Because this is absolutely just mind-bogglingly frustrating, the Rangers' horrendous stats in one-run games. Now... Are they doing some little things wrong? Sure. Did they deserve to lose this one? I don't know. Maybe. But it's just absolutely insane. And you can chalk it up to various in 2015. This is literally, I think, just karma for 2015. The Rangers were obscenely good in 2015. Now, part of that was they had one of the best bullpens in franchise history. It was absolutely disgusting. They uh, were powered by a very, very tight Divisional race with the Houston Astros, who everyone claimed was going to win the World Series that year, and you know had the basically the exact same core as when they allegedly won a World Series um, some years later. I don't remember when because uh, I don't know that it actually happened. But this is their regression is hitting them extremely, extremely hard. In one run games, they are now five and twenty two, five and twenty two. That's a win record below a win percentage of 18.5% in one-run games. It should be around 50%. It just should be. It, it The Rangers bullpen is not this bad. The Rangers are not full of a bunch of like entirely rookies who don't know how to win, don't know how to you know do things. It should be much, much higher than that. But this is that regression from 2015. Hopefully it all corrects itself next year. I'm sure it'll be a lot better when the with the Rangers, you know, having a much better pen in Jonathan Hernandez and Holly Leclerc starting to figure out who they are again. And eventually when the Rangers get their uh, former closer, Joe Barlow back. And I mean, having Matt Moore and Brock Burke in there and Dennis Santana, when he's on like, this should be a, at least halfway decent bullpen. And the Rangers should not be <laughs> what they are five and 22 in one run games. Coming up, I'm going to talk about the Rangers signing Dallas Keuchel, a former Cy Young winner, why it makes absolutely no difference, and it also kind of signals a little bit of a worry and three reasons, five reasons, actually, why Martin Perez should not be considered being traded. But first, this episode is brought to you by Blue Nile. Whether you're ready to pop the question or celebrating a milestone moment, find jewelry as unique as her with the modern convenience of online shopping at BlueNile.com. Blue Nile has simple online tools to let you choose the diamond shape, size, and clarity, as well as setting style. Blue Nile's bench jewelers will then handcraft her perfect engagement ring. Each ring is one of a kind. If you're looking for fine jewelry but having trouble choosing, Blue Nile has jewelry experts on hand 24-7. They're available via phone, 
or via chat to help you find a memorable gift at every single budget. Make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. And going on now is the Blue Nile Anniversary Sale. Save up to 40% on classic fine jewelry pieces and 25% on engagement rings. Engagement ring settings, excuse me. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that will not give away what's inside. Shop stress-free and find your favorite piece. Go to BlueNile.com today. Now, the Rangers signed Dallas Keuchel, not to a major league deal, but to a minor league deal. He will report to Round Rock, and you think, oh, wow, the Rangers got a guy whose name is Dallas. You should probably change it to Arlington. Or, uh, as I tweeted many, many years ago when the Rangers were absolutely thumping it, one of my best tweets of all time, Dallas Keuchel should change his name to Houston Keuchel because he sucks now. And, you know, that still pretty much applies. He still sucks now very badly. He's had some good moments. He started the season with Chicago. He was half decent for them in 2020. He has had some half decent moments in his career, like when he did allegedly win a Cy Young, a two-time All-Star that Cy Young was in 2015. He was actually pretty good in that year. He also is a multiple-time Gold Glove winner. Um, Let's see, five-time Gold Glove winner, two-time All-Star, allegedly won the 2017 World Series. Guy grew up in Tulsa, um, went to college in Fayetteville at Arkansas, and this year has been flat out due to garbage. He did finish top five in Cy Young voting all the way back in 2022. 2021 was still a little bit of a rough one, did pitch the full season, only went 162 innings despite starting 30 games, had an ERA over five. This year has an ERA of 8.53 in two different stops. The first one was with Chicago, eight, eight games there. 32 innings, so literally averaging four innings to start. That's not great. A 788 ERA. Then Arizona signed him, thought, heck, we don't have that much to lose. Why not sign a guy? See if there's still something in there. Four starts there, 964 ERA, 18 and two thirds innings. Was a little bit more than four innings per start, but still, the bad starts have been bad. There have been some good ones for him this season. Did have five shutout innings against the Yankees back when he was with the White Sox, but then the very next game, He started against the Yankees as well, four innings, six earned runs. He also had a couple, his bad bad starts have been really horrendous at Cleveland, his second start of the season. One inning, 10 runs, seven of those were earned. Really, really got lit up there. He had a two inning start against Boston where he gave up six earned runs. That ended up being his last one for the White Sox. Also had a couple of decent starts. Well, I should say one decent start for Arizona. Did go seven innings, but allowed three runs. Like, that's fine for a guy who's going to be your number five starter. But a couple of pretty bad ones as well. Actually, for the most part, pretty bad ones. Had four and a third innings where he allowed four runs at Detroit. That's really, really looking bad. Um, He also had a five-inning outing where he allowed seven runs at Colorado. It's cores that will happen. But the last one, that was the final straw with Arizona. Uh, Two and a third innings, eight runs, seven of those were earned, three home runs at San Francisco. Yeah, that will get you knocked right out the door. And the Raiders signed to a minor league deal because, I don't know, it might just be for depth at Round Rock. That honestly might be what it is at this point, but it's kind of a little bit, a little bit concerning to me. I think it might be um, a concern with their starting pitching right now. It's Cole Wynn and Jake Latz and Cole Reagans. And I'm not sure who else is the other starter in AAA at this point. It's not Spencer Howard. Um, it's not, well, actually it might be Colby Howard at this point. And it's not AJ Lexi. He's not starting anymore. But it might it might honestly just be for AAA depth. But at, at this point, I don't know. Dane Downing is coming back. That is a very, very nice thing for the Raiders rotation. They need him. He is going to start tonight. I thought he was going to miss three weeks initially, but he is only going to miss two weeks. The Rangers very much need him back in their rotation, so they're going to have to make a decision on either um, Spencer Howard or Taylor Hearn. I think the Taylor Hearn starting experiment is pretty much over at this point. I think he's going to go back into a late inning relief role, which is where he has thrived. He's been at his best, which is a real bummer. Really like the guy. He had some pretty good moments and I really thought that he was going to be a starter but it just seems like it's just not to be so put him back in the back of the pen have him be extremely nasty and we'll roll with the four or five of Glenn Otto and Spencer Howard at this point and you know 
I don't know. I don't know if, if current Dallas Keuchel is going to be better than Spencer Howard. I really think that it's only a matter of time before Spencer Howard, even though he's been going deeper into games, he's still giving up four or five runs pretty much every single start. I, I feel like it's only a matter of time before the Rangers just bite the bullet and put him in the back of the pen, let his nasty stuff just ride um, and see him be hopefully a highly effective back into the bullpen reliever. But yeah, the Dallas Keuchel signing is also kind of a concern that, you know, it would not be nice if Cole Wynn had just stepped up and they could have just put Spencer Howard in the bullpen earlier. Um, it, or maybe Glenn Otto in the bullpen. I, I don't know. Glenn Otto has not done anything to lose his rotation spot as the number four or five at this point. If Cole Wynn figures out how to not walk everybody and remembers how to strike people out and, you know, has shown that shows that he is ready for a major league call-up, then great. He will probably take that role, but he, he is not anywhere near that. Cole Reagans is probably a lot closer with the season that he is having. Jack Leiter is still struggling in double-A, so I don't think that he is you know imminent to the big leagues. Same goes with most of the others in that double-A rotation. So I don't know, it, it might just be a triple-A depth signing, but it also might be a real cause for concern um, about Cole Wynn and his struggles this season. But coming up, I'm going to get into the five reasons why the Texas Rangers should not consider trading Martin Perez. The first, this episode is brought to you by the Sports Card Investor app. Welcome to the world of sports cards reimagined. The Sports Card Investor app is the hobby's most powerful resource. You can quickly check the value of your favorite cards, find great deals, and profit from the hobby that you love. Available completely for free in the Google Play and Apple App Stores. The Sports Card Investor app is a must-have for baseball fans and you know sports fans in general. It's completely free and you can easily browse over 630,000 cards from every sport with hundreds more added each week. Check the latest values of your favorite cards with 7-day or 30-day charts. Find the best prices and buy directly through the app with our eBay deals feature. You can find breakout stars if you want to get an Adoles Garcia card. If you, <laughs> if you really want to get a Dallas Keigel card, I'm sure you could make that happen. A Dane Dunning card. Uh, whoever you want card they have got all kinds of different cards. If you're feeling nostalgic for some old players, you want an Adrian Beltre card, um, you want a Nolan Ryan card, what have you. They have got all kinds, so go check it out. Download the Sports Card Investor app today, available for free in the Google Play and Apple App Stores, or go to sportscardinvestor.com slash locked on. Now, there are many reasons why Martin Perez should not be traded from the Rangers. as He shouldn't even be considered being traded. He has said that he is happy here. Um, he has also said that he doesn't expect to be traded, but that contract extensions talks have not happened yet. But that's not really a red flag as much it is, as it is how this front office does business. They don't really talk extensions during the season. It really doesn't happen that much. Um, it happened a little bit with Joey Gallo last year, and we all saw how that went. So, yeah, best to just best to just let him stay here. They're going to have a meeting. The front office is going to have a meeting this week to try and figure out, all right, are we going to be buyers or sellers at the deadline? What is our plan? Are we going to keep Martin Perez, and then, or are we going to try and trade him and then bring him back in the offseason or trade him and not bring him back in the offseason? Now, I have a lot of reasons, a lot more than five reasons, but I'm going to get it down to the five best reasons why the Rangers should not trade him. Number one, the front office said they're trying to compete this year, this year, and especially next year. That is the hard, hard deadline of, all right, you really have to be above 500, have to be at least halfway decent next year. And you cannot do that by trading away your best player. He has been the best player on this Rangers team. He was the lone initial all-star selection, a 3.4 war so far. At this point, he is top 10 in ERA and innings and all kinds of other categories. He has been so good for this team. And if you want to contend, that sends a bad message to your locker room if you're trading away that number one of your staff, the best guy on your team. It is a huge demoralizer, and the Rangers will probably at least go a little bit more into the tank. Plus, they need him. They absolutely need him. Number two, he wants to freaking be here. He wants to be here. 
You know how rare it is to find a guy you tr- that you randomly bring back after all that he had been through with the Rangers and all that he had been through in Boston and Minnesota. He wanted to come back here desperately. He loves it here. He is thriving here. You're probably going to get a better price on an extension than he would get on the open market from somebody else. Like, he wants to be here. It is a no-brainer that you keep guys who want to be here. I feel like the same could have been said about Joey Gallo, but the Rangers ended up just coming away like absolute bandits in that trade, plus might be able to bring him back anyway. So the guys who want to be here, I say you keep them there. I mean, Kyle Gibson also wanted to be here last year, but the Rangers were (laughs) horrendous, and trading him made all the sense in the world, even if the return hasn't looked like the best freaking thing, saying with Ian Kennedy. But still, if they want to be here, and you're not in the absolute tank, which the Rangers are not there. They're not in the absolute tank. They're still fighting for, well, they're nine games under 500, which is the worst mark of the season. But they're not horrendous. They are better. And if you are better and trying to continue to improve and improve that record, one of the best ways you can do that is by not trading away your number one starting pitcher. Just don't do that. That would be a bad idea. Now, number three. He won't even be the most valuable pitcher on the market, even if he is the best. I'm not sure at this point that he is the best. Luis Castillo of the Reds is really freaking good. He is having a great season. He was an all-star this year, a two-time all-star in his career. He is a 3.2 war player, so by baseball reference war, he is having a slightly worse season than Martin Perez, but he's still been really dang good. 13 starts in 78 innings, 82 strikeouts, a 277 ERA. Tyler Malley. Um, has been, well, about league average. He's got 18 starts under his belt, 98 in a third innings, 107 strikeouts, been pretty darn good with the strikeouts and ERA plus of 102, actual ERA of 448. That has been not quite as good, and I'm not sure if that isn't just a product of him being on the Cincinnati freaking Reds. But both those guys have two years, or I guess a year and a half of control. You have them for this season. You have them for all of next season. That makes them a lot more valuable. Same with Frankie Montas of the A's, who's having a really darn good season there and has had a couple of good seasons in a row. I'm still just floored that he hasn't been traded yet. I thought he'd be traded at the beginning of the season. I don't know what they were waiting for. Maybe for teams to get more desperate in this playoff run. With an expanded playoff run, there should be more teams that are buyers. Maybe that was a thought. They wait until the middle of the season when teams get more desperate, when an injury happens, and that can jack the price way up. But still, you're also losing half a season of trading him. I also thought that Mally and Castillo, all three of these guys, I thought, who all have the year and a half of control, would be dealt before the season started, because we all knew both those teams were going right into the tank from the jump. So, there's also Pablo Lopez, who the Mariners are in a rough, rough way right now. Their best player, best position player, I should say, Jazz Chisholm, is on the 60-day IL, and their offense, as we saw when the Rangers faced them, is just absolutely That is the only empirically correct way to describe it. But they have Sandy Alcantara, who... I don't think they should trade, who has been probably the best pitcher in all of baseball this season. That would be a tough, tough ask. But they also have Pablo Lopez, who the Rangers saw and promptly lit up, who is still a very, very good pitcher and still still pretty darn young. He's been in the big leagues for a while, but has two more full seasons of control. So you get two and a half years of this guy who has been really, really freaking good for the Marlins this year. The Marlins have been... The Marlins and the Guardians and the Rays and the uh, the Dodgers, which it feels unfair to include the Dodgers because they're good at everything, but those teams have been just so, so good at developing fantastic starting pitchers, and Pablo Lopez is one of those guys. He is a right-handed thrower from Venezuela. The Rangers saw how good he can be. He has a 3.14 ERA in 19 starts, 109 games or 109 innings, excuse me, this season, and 107 strikeouts, a 2.4 war, according to baseball reference, a career ERA in 81 starts of 381. He has been really darn good, had a 307 ERA in 20 starts last year, 102 innings. It's been really darn good this season, has been able to stay healthy. I think that they should probably punt on this season. We all know that they have no offense, so... 
they're going to compete, which they've got the arms to do so, but they do not have the bats, especially not without Jazz Chisholm. I think they should probably think about dealing this guy. So he would be, if he is on the market, he would be the most, the most valuable trade starting pitcher, and that would put Martin Perez about fifth. And that's not including some of the other guys that would be on the market, some Zach Greinke's or what have you. But I think Martin Perez is right about fifth most valuable starting pitcher on this market. And we saw what the Rangers can get in their starting pitcher trades. Obviously, Mike, the Mike Miner deal ended up turning into a fleece. Don't know how they did that. Dustin Harris just wasn't impressing enough and immediately became a world beater when he went to the Rangers. But, I mean, Dane Dunning is fine for what I think was – a year and a, uh, was two years of Lance Lynn. Actually, it might have just been one full year at that point. But Spencer Howard is not looking like a great return. And the Kyle Gibson deal, who had a year and a half of control, along with a pretty darn good reliever at the time, Ian Kennedy. Like, I have not been super enthused. The Joey Gallo return, notwithstanding, like, the, the last few trades in a seller's market for the Rangers have not been, you know, an overwhelming bounty of great prospects. So I don't know how big of a difference half a season of Martin Perez is going to make for some of the other guys. And I also think that Kyle Gibson, you know, not doing super well in Philadelphia might have driven the price down on these guys of the Martin Perez, Kyle Gibson, Lance Lynn, Mike Miner variety. And that, Oh, whatever the Rangers are doing, it's, you know, smoke and mirrors that only really works on the Rangers. I think Lance Lynn's success kind of, you know, knocks that notion out of people's heads. But, I mean, Mike Miner kind of fell apart uh, even in his last season with the Rangers and when he went to Oakland and the other places after that. And Kyle Gibson has just been kind of mediocre what he was before in the other places since that. So I don't necessarily know if people are going to buy the Martin Perez uh, rejuvenation. And I don't know if it's going to sustain somewhere else. So, that might also be a good reason why not to consider trading him. Number four, there aren't that many great free agent pitchers available on the market after this season. I mean, there I mean, there are, I should say. There aren't that many that are, I think, are gettable and that are at a price that the Rangers would want to get tied up in. I mean, there's Adam Wainwright, who will be 41 years old. There's Nathan Ivaldi, who will be 33 years old next season. If you want to go another round in the Clayton Kershaw, will they, won't they? You could be convinced to do that, but I still think that um, unless the Rangers finish above 500, I don't think Kershaw will consider coming to Texas unless he decides that's his last season. I still think part of me thinks that there's like a little part of him that wants to pitch just one season in Texas and then call it a career, but he will be, I believe, 35 next season. That's not ideal. Zach Greinke, Sean Mania, um, who's going to be 30 next year. You want to try the Kyle Gibson experiment again or the Mike Miner experiment again. Um, that is certainly an option. But the best pitchers on the market are probably going to be the two guys who are in San Diego right now in Joe Musgrove and Sean Manaya. And I, I don't necessarily see San Diego letting those guys walk away, especially not Joe Musgrove and probably not Sean Manaya either. So there are not a lot of inspiring options when you look past that. Like I said, I think Martin Perez is better than most of those options. I don't think he's better than Joe Musgrove, and I think he's kind of on par with Sean Manai. He's shown this season, but there's not a whole lot of other options. And the final point, which kind of adds on to that, even if the Rangers do go get another guy in free agency, the Rangers don't have a lot of guys barging down the doors. The Rangers want to compete next year. They have two very good starters right now. They have Martin Perez. They have John Gray. And they have three, excuse me, they have one one guy who I think is, you know, four or five capable, Dane Dunning. He's fine. He's fine. He's about major league average. You need some of those guys for depth in your system, in your rotation. Um, but ideally, if you're competing, you only have really one of those guys in your rotation. And the final three spots of the guys who are um, on the will they, won't they wheel of Glenn Otto and uh, Taylor Hearn and Spencer Howard, ideally, like, those are those guys are probably not in your rotation if you're trying to compete next year. So say you go get a, um, I don't know, a Sean Manaya or a Kyle Gibson or a Joe Musgrove, whatever. The Rangers still 
don't have those guys that are beating down the door to Arlington. I mean, Cole Wynn has really, really struggled this season, and maybe Cole Reagans is ready for the big leagues next year. Maybe he's a little bit better than what Glenn Otto is giving you. I'm not entirely sure. We'll see. Um, maybe Owen White makes that jump and gets up to AAA and knocks on the big league door next year. Maybe Jack Leiter does it. Enti- entirely possible that Jack Leiter does it and figures out his fastball command, which has been an issue for him this season. But those are all big if, maybe, when, whatevers. Martin Perez seems like a constant, at the very least, even if he reverts back to what he was, that's still a solid, well, depends on which version of what he was. Even if he regresses a little bit, he's still probably, at worst, a number three in your rotation. And right now, he's a number one, one of the top ten pitchers in the American League. Like, you cannot afford to just let this guy walk away or to trade him for what will likely be not a great return if you do decide to fleece somebody if someone does like shoot the moon and says oh my gosh we need martin perez right now we're going to give you one of our top 10 prospects then maybe make that deal if you say hey martin we're going to trade you here to this contender and um if you want to come back next year we will sign you to a longer term contract to keep you here because you love it here so much and we love you but again that's a bunch of ifs maybes and you know possible scenarios not certainties so i don't think it's a great idea for the rangers to entertain trades on martin paris unless they are absolute ro- highway robberies like the gallo deal last year if you can get um you know what ends up being probably three maybe even four big league regulars out of it that would be um an absolute coup But, again, that was a year and a half of a pretty darn good position player. Martin Perez is a one-time All-Star who is having a great career season. But I don't know that anybody is going to blow the Rangers out of the water with a deal that makes it worth it for the Rangers to consider it. So, yeah, we talked about uh, Dallas Keuchel coming in, another frustrating one-run loss, and why Martin Perez should not be considered being traded. On tomorrow's episode, I'm going to go the other way why the Rangers should consider trading Martin Perez. We'll talk a little bit about that Dane Dunning first start back off the IL and how he looks. Plus, I don't know. We'll see what else we get into into later on in the week. I'm still trying to schedule an episode with Locked On MLB Prospects. Go check out Lindsey Crosby's show. We're going to talk a little about the draft. Hopefully sometime this week, but we will nail down the specifics. I will let you know when I know when that episode is going to come out. That's going to do it for today's edition of Locked on Rangers. Until next time, don't forget to enjoy baseball.